but are largely exempted. So actually they were able to exhibit without too much trouble, even quite soon after the, I mean, I've just mentioned in 1950, which is still during the American occupation. So art became a way of talking about what had happened that couldn't be done in, in print form, uh, in, you know, in, in words. Now in 1953, hopefully you can see that, is that coming through? All right, I'll just assume it is from now on. The panels began their international tour. So this is um, various different, um, different countries where they're being exhibited, um, published in 1958. So by then they'd, they'd been quite around the world from, for example, um, Pyongyang, Copenhagen, um, Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, Peking or Be Beijing, um, Amsterdam and Coventry. So um, they were awarded a peace award by the World Peace Council and an international exhibition was formed to organize the Comprehensive World Tour, which began in Beijing in uh, August 1956. The panels visited several of the socialist countries in Asia before they went to Western Europe. And then after they were in South Africa, exhibited in Johannesburg and Cape Town, they arrived in Sydney in early 1958. February, the tour's honorary secretary, Stephen Murray Smith, released a press statement explaining that galleries had been confirmed for Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth, but Sydney had refused the exhibition and Hobart and Brisbane had claimed a lack of space. The National Gallery of New South Wales refusal uh, generated some controversy and the decision was later reversed. So it seems like um, the basic content of that was that a lot of sensitivity over the war primarily. Uh, and War Memory, and there were some angry letters published about um, uh, about uh, the exhibition. But um, basically the overwhelming support and uh, meant that the, the trustees reversed their decision. So it was exhibited, uh, and there's a bit of a, a panel here in Melbourne, um, Adelaide, National Gallery of, of South Australia there, in Perth, I haven't found much about the Perth exhibition, uh, and then at Sydney in um, July. And then there was the New Zealand exhibition, and they came back to Australia to be exhibited in Canberra the following, early in the following year. And as far as I can tell, that came later because of the success of the exhibition, the Canberra people put it on. They were the only private uh, exhibition. Um, and interestingly, this travelling exhibition became um, quite a cultural phenomenon. So, um, yes, here's one of the letters with pressure. So, for example, in the Melbourne exhibition, the Bulletin uh, magazine, which was fairly hostile to the exhibition in general in its coverage, noted that for the first time in Melbourne's history, the hours of opening of an art show have had to be extended by imperious popular demand, with a continuous panel streaming past the panel, a uh, continuous procession streaming past the panels. And we're lucky that these crowds are actually captured by in this photograph by the Croatian Australian photographer, Mark Strizic, who had recently started a job at the gallery documenting exhibitions. So I um, was very happy to find this, this photo of people you know, really thronging into the exhibition, as you can see. Adelaide, the director of the gallery, observed that it was the highest exhibition attendance they'd ever had with claims of 75,000. And in Sydney, the police were called to help control crowds The 7,000 uh, went in a single day with comparisons made to the crowds for the royal robes in regalia. I'm sorry, I'm not keeping up here. So this is the Adelaide, um, Adelaide crowds, as you can see, uh, and Sydney. Um, okay, so the tour secretary summarised in October that uh, in writing in Overland that uh, the, the exhibition had probably been seen by over a quarter of a million people while it was in Australia. And this is no doubt what prompted the Canberra Art Club and the Artist Society of Canberra to partner with the tour and bring the panels back to Australia in early 1959, where interestingly, it was opened by Sir Mark Oliphant, who was one of Australia's leading uh, atomic scientists and had helped develop the um, atomic bomb. Um, and he, you know, he gave a, a speech where he said the panel should persuade viewers that war was no longer either decent or profitable. So I think it's a, that I found very significant that in this, a, a big theme in, in the work I've developed from this, which I, I won't get into much today, but basically was the reaction of scientists 
and the development of an anti-nuclear movement among scientists and how that plays out later in the uranium debate in Australia. And here we have you know, the leading light of Australian nuclear physics um, opening exhibition as a sort of um, anti-nuclear statement. Okay, so the other reason we might uh, consider, uh, as well as sort of the politics of nuclear weapons, was that we're in an era where popular culture is really taking off, mass popular culture. So um, tele television broadcasting had arrived in 1956, and the panels were actually screened on the ABC by, uh, in a screening previewed, uh, hosted by Mungo McCallum, before the opening in Sydney. Uh, the Bulletin also published um, several articles uh, about the exhibition, mostly fairly critical, and the Australian Women's Weekly social pages, you know, splashed a uh, couple of pages with calling it the event of the Sydney's art world. So, you know, this potentially obscure exhibition actually became a, a really mass, uh, mass cultural phenomenon. And, um, you know, when Sydney uh, Morning Herald was reviewing the year, uh, in 1958, at the end of 1958, they called, uh, they included the, the panels um, as perhaps the most expressive arrivals to have, have come to Sydney that year. So I've, I like to, I'm sort of looking at this from three, three different scales uh, to sort of look into the exhibition as a phenomenon, one of which is the world peace movement. So in her study of the peace movement in post-war Japan, Saria Hiroe notes that it was already a transnational movement in the 1940s. It's kind of, I guess, a trend in social movement studies to talk about the 70s as the big birth of transnational social movements. But you know, really, when we look at the nuclear issues and peace issues, it does go back much further. In fact, labor movement too. It's sort of a um, theoretically convenient, but factually not very uh, accurate <laughs> claim. Now, the American test at the Bikini Atoll in, um, in 1946 created a new imperative for peace activists to organize transnationally, and we've talked about that in the previous session. But at the same time, there was an intensifying, intensifying rivalry between the socialist and non-socialist worlds. And this also created conflict within the peace movement over what peace meant and how the peace movement related to the socialist bloc. So in 1949, the Communist Information Bureau or Cominform resolved that peace would be the major focus for communist parties around the world. In 1949, a World Peace Congress was established in Paris, which recommended that national peace committees be created in every country. It also established a World Peace Council with a permanent executive, which was chaired by Professor Frederick Joliet Curie, the Nobel Prize winning physicist. Now, all but one of the members of the executive were communists or sympathetic. Um, and this group uh, launched the Stockholm Appeal in March 1950, which called for a ban on atomic weapons. The signature campaign initiated as part of that uh, appeal gathered 6.45 million signatures in Japan. Now, these, this panel here, Yaizu, um, comes later in the series, wasn't exhibited in Australia, but it just shows you that the Marukis are uh, developed in communication with this movement, both domestically and internationally. So this, this is the picture. In, uh, Yaizu is the port in Japan from which the Lucky Dragon number no. five sailed and to which it returned after being irradiated at Bikini Atoll. And the following panel, which unfortunately I haven't included here, is called Petition. And it shows the um, people signing onto the, the petition, which was um, launched in response to uh, the Stockholm Appeal. Uh, sorry, in response to the Bikini um, uh, incident. So a number of prominent artists like the Marukis joined in the post-war peace movement. Um, when the young marathon runner Stan Horsham was arrested during his relay Sophia uh, to Sheffield for the 1950 World Peace Conference, he was carrying a peace baton that bore the most famous emblem of the movement, the Dove of Peace designed by Pablo Picasso. Nevertheless, Picasso was uh, criticized by the party, although he was a party member, for his rejection of socialist realism. Similarly, the Marukis um, had both a political and artistic purpose in their, um, in their work, and, but they actually later broke with the, with the Communist Party, not, not long after this, actually. Um, okay, so I've sort of covered this already. And so then when we turn to the Australian scale, so sort of gone from the globe down to the Australian context, in Australia, the atomic bomb 
really prompted concerns among pacifist trade unionist communists and others who were concerned about what kind of world order was emerging after the end of the Second World War. The Australian Peace Council was uh, founded in 1949 uh, with various regional bodies and the idea was to campaign against nuclear testing in the Pacific and it organised uh, peace conferences together with Communist Party, trade unions and left factions of the Australian Labor Party. They took up the Stockholm Appeal and protested new British nuclear testing in Kiribati and in Australia. The Communist Party was, uh, was a key figure and dif different historiographers I mean, basically, um, you know, many will claim it was a communist front, which was also the argument at the time. I think there's a more complex uh, relationship there, but certainly the Communist Party was probably the, if not, certainly a, if not the dominant, dominant force within it. Um, and the first three secretaries of the APC were all party members. Um, but the, uh, this tour, was sponsored by some of the leading lights of Australian intellectual and artistic life at the time. So it included, I'll just, um, here we go. The sponsors of the tour here were painters, William Dargie, Lloyd Rees, W.E. Pigeon, Roderick Shaw, George Lawrence, the poet, Dame Mary Gilmore, the English actor, Dame Sybil Thorndike, and the writer, Vance Palmer, and the Bishop of Tasmania, Geoffrey Cranswick, Mianjin editor, Clem Christensen, and Stephen Murray Smith, the secretary, who was also editor of Overland and who at that time was a member of the CPA, although not long after again, he actually left. Um, Vance Palmer, who wrote the foreword, which you should be able to see here, was then one of Australia's most prominent writers. He was never a party member, but was an active peace, uh, in peace movements since the 1930s, actually even before that. So he and his family were deeply affected by the Spanish Civil War. Nettie Palmer, to whom he was married, uh, was a very active campaigner in the relief movement in Spain, for, for Spain, um, the Spanish Civil War in Melbourne, and their daughter, Eileen Palmer, was a volunteer in Spain with the Republicans. Um, Vance's involvement in the nascent peace movement after World War II saw him travel to Helsinki in 1955. And I'm speculating that this might have been where the links were, were forged that eventually led to the exhibition in Australia. So he wrote to his friend, um, a friend in Australia in that year, that about his meetings with Rewi Ali, who was, uh, I think, New Zealand, but uh, sorry, Australian communist who lived in China, um, about the, yeah, he says, we Australians gave the Asians a little party yesterday, Chinese, Indians, Japanese, Indonesians, Vietnamese, etc. And he describes how they got along together, um, no long speeches, but each leader introducing different members of his group, um, in a jolly witty way and the whole thing ending in gift giving and signing. And I found this particularly interesting is that, you know, in another letter he wrote to Stephen, uh, Stephen Murray Smith on his way home, he wrote, most impressed by the part of the Asian representatives um, and the new content they are giving the word peace. We've so long thought of peace as being merely the absence of war, a return to a remembered state of quiescence. To them, peace means something quite different. It is not negative, it is positive. It has not a sedative effect, it has the sound of trumpets. So I, I contend that there's, you know, a genuine um, kind of intellectual exchange going on here. Okay, it's still small numbers of people involved. Um, that basically set the scene for this successful tour in 1958. Um, and then um, finally, we have this growing peace movement in the region. So. In 1950, so, uh, sorry, the, yeah, in the region. So in 1956, there was a film screening of the Hiroshima panels actually was turned into a film a bit earlier. So that was shown in Sydney. 1957, um, we have some um, Australian authors, Catherine Susanna Pritchard and Eileen Palmer, again, both Communist Party members, were planning to join the Peace Fleet, which was a small sh fleet of ships intended to sail from Japan to the Christmas Islands to protest the British atomic test. Now this didn't actually happen, but the relationships did continue. So Eileen Palmer was invited to attend the Third World Congress against atomic and hydrogen weapons in Tokyo, where she was an interpreter for the Spanish and French delegations. She also visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki and wrote about uh, her experiences there, gave talks. Um, for example, her poems, Marilinga, and Straw in the Wind talk about the nuclear threat. And this one, Song from a Distant Epoch, um, talks about basically a visit, it's inspired by her visit to Hiroshima and the impact of um, atomic weapons on children. Back in Australia, there was a, um, 
jumped ahead there. Uh, there was also um, protests against British nuclear testing from Melbourne Trades Hall. And for example, the National Peace Conference in South Australia invited the Japanese socialist politician Matsumoto Jitsiro to um, join a public forum alongside Labor Party uh, member Clyde Cameron. But in terms of the story of the panels themselves, what's interesting about them is that the influence that the Australian tour and the controversy it generated had on the artists. So in 1950, uh, following the 1958 exhibition, um, there was quite a decent um, delegation, 20 people from Australia to the Japanese, again, the annual National World Congress they held there. Um, but Toshi also dwells in her book about the world tour on the impact that the critiques from sort of uh, former prisoners of war uh, of their work had on her. Now she wasn't actually in Australia for the tour. The artists had returned home before then, but they did receive correspondence from um, both the tour committee, but also Japanese um, journalists, etc., in Australia. So, you know, she opens her book on the tour with a kind of uh, dialogue inspired by this controversy. We heard the words you say, do not forget Hiroshima. Well, there's something we do not want you to forget either. What's that? Changi. We did not know what Changi meant. Now, you know, in, in the context of the Japanese peace movement, um, we have, you know, in its early days, a very sort of victim-centred narrative around what was done to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, here, you know, you're starting to see um, Maruki Toshi expressing an understanding of the sort of complicity of Japan and Japanese people in what happened uh, in, in the war. That wasn't really part of the original Hiroshima narrative um, and, and probably still isn't part of a fairly sanitized government approved version of Hiroshima narrative. So obviously Changi refers to the, the notorious prisoner of war camp in Singapore and Toshi actually reprints a lot of letters in Japanese translation from uh, Australian newspapers or people talking for and against um, the exhibition. Uh, and for me, I think the fact that she chose to do so suggests that it had quite a deep impact on her. Later, the, only in the 1970s were the panels exhibited in the United States, so they couldn't, that was not politically going to be possible at that time. And much more intense, I mean, they actually went to the US with the panels and were confronted by... Um, So yeah, they were confronted there by, um, so I'm sort of, um, might just leave it there, more or less. Oh yes, I, but uh, the final sort of response to that, which I think, um, have I lost the screen yet? Just to show you the final response of the, um, is this panel, Death of the American Prisoners of War, uh, completed in 1971, where they um, painted a scene partly possibly apocryphal, but they found that um, there were stories in Hiroshima that American prisoners of war were beaten to death after the, the bomb by locals as a sort of vengeance anger. And they tried to actually bring that into the story. So it starts off the early panels very much a victim narrative and eventually starts to develop this more complicated politics of peace. The following um, panel, Crows, um, is to tries to acknowledge the number of ethnic Koreans who were in many cases forced laborers or certainly um, second class citizens who were also impacted and who are pretty much left out of kind of nationalistic narratives of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as a crime against Japan per se. So I'm sort of positioning, trying to argue here that the tour helps, um, is both a product of this growing peace movement and its transnationalism, but also then speaks back to an understanding within the Japanese movement of the, the complexities of, of what they were doing. Thank you. Now, that's right, and now I have to introduce the next person. So thank you for that. Um, set a bad example, I think I've gone slightly over time. But um, let me now um, introduce our next speaker. Uh, so Paul Brown, talking about creative arts and nuclear weapons. Paul is an uh, honorary position at the School of Humanities and Languages at, U at UNSW and has published in the fields of geology, uh, environmental humanities, eco-criticism, creative arts practice, and science and technology studies. So thank you very much. Over to you, Paul.
Well, let me just check that everything's in order. Can you see my screen? Yeah, and it's full screen. And you can hear me by the sounds of it. Okay, thank you. Alexander, that was amazing. Thank you very much for taking me through that history, which I, I really didn't know a great deal about. Um, very inspiring. Um, I'm going to talk largely now from the perspective of a practitioner, uh, which was really the way Alexander put this to me. In fact, he originally asked me to talk about a project called Half a Life, um, which I had reported on to an ARPS conference um, 16 years ago uh, in 2005, when that project was just getting underway. So part of what I'm going to do is to talk about Half a Life, um, and you'll find a, a fair bit of focus on uh, the performing arts. Uh, and that's partly because I know who's coming next. Um, I suspect JD <laughs> will provide a lot of focus on, on the visual arts. Um, so uh, let's get going. Mine is a, uh, a slideshow uh, and I, I'm going to try to put a weave of um, both commentary about uh, the processes of making atomic art and also some of the political context in which projects that, uh, that I've worked on um, have been conducted. So now I'm in trouble. I'm trying to progress and it's not doing it. Ah, oh, yes, here we go. All right, um, I'm, I need to acknowledge that, um, especially in the performing arts, I'd say, the endeavors are very collaborative and um, the work that I've been doing has drawn on the, the, uh, the talents and energies of, of a whole lot of people. Um, the Yalata artists that, that we've worked with are uh, listed there. And then uh, my company, which is Alphaville, um, a company that focuses on the connection between arts, science, environment and community, um, has had the good fortune to work with a whole range of um, artists and, and they are listed there. And when I do get around to talking about Half a Life, that was a project that was developed with the um, Nuclear Veterans Associations of both Australia and the United Kingdom. And then there's a, a number of people who've, if you like, been the bellows to some of the work that we've been doing, coming in every now and again to fire it up. And they're listed there as advisors and mentors. So um, I'm going to use this term atomic arts um, it's, it's one that uh, is a bit of a broad church, as, as I'll try and explain, and uh, talk about uh, the Australian scene mostly, um, underscoring that it really is a realm of, of multi-arts. There's no discipline that has not tackled um, nuclear issues in Australia, from songs through to television series, um, from visual arts through to literature, um, in, in uh, theatre, film, um, it's, it's been content that has been tackled um, by all those disciplines and uh, especially so since the, the, the Royal Commission into British nuclear testing in the 1980s, which made, made things uh, public to the extent that it, it became, uh, uh, British nuclear testing became a, a topic favoured by many artists. And uh, I, I picked up on some phrasing that Alexander used in his own introduction uh, and probably talked about um, this morning that what I think creative artists are doing is helping to, uh, to make the history. And especially if it's community arts, they're doing that in conjunction with the atomic survivor communities who've got first-hand experience. The, the political context over the, the, the 20 to 30 year horizon um, that I've been working on this uh, has, has changed uh, uh, and syncreted um, in very interesting ways. But at the bottom of it are stories of invasion, uh, migration stories, which is largely the type of story that um, our key informants in our work with uh, Maralinga communities, uh, they're the kinds of stories that they've told us. Uh, the, the work of the Royal Commissions, um, 
the the exposure of what went on behind the scenes, um, which I which I know Liz has talked about and written about. Um, land rights issues, uh, waste dumps, one of the, the more contemporary contexts um, at the moment, uh, nuclear veterans rights, peace initiatives, and um, up to the moment, the work on the nuclear weapons ban treaty. Um, I just want to start then a, a, a tour through uh, some of the work that uh, we were involved with in South Australia and try and make some connections between the, the art making and, and the politics of the day. And these, these images come from um, the, the, the Parliament steps in Adelaide uh, at a time when the Royal Commission into South Australia's nuclear industry um, had begun its, its work and, and its focus on whether South Australia should accept waste from the rest of the world and whether there should be a, a low to intermediate level waste dump. And uh, a coalition of, of many different um, communities and organisations uh, mobilised against this and, and this is one of the bigger rallies. And the, the people centre stage uh, come from the community of Yalata in the far west of South Australia. And they're standing underneath a, a large banner. Um, I'll show you a better shot of that later on, um, which was produced in May of uh, 2016 and, and became a, a kind of um, gathering point for some of the public events that, that uh, these, these people from Yalata got involved with. And um, uh, the, the guy in the white hat is Johnny Lovett, who uh, wrote a song uh, called Maralinga. Uh, and then it was translated into Pitjantjara by the the, uh, the people in that front row, in fact, uh, and uh, and then produced as as a CD. And um, that that project was one among uh, a dozen or so that were arts projects running in 2016 uh, that that gained valency in the context of the campaign against um, nuclear waste dumps. Um, some of the, uh, the, the artwork uh, was used on the cover of it. That's one of the paintings um, by a Yalata artist, Marianne Finlay. Uh, and that's the, that's the group in the studio. Here's that banner again. And um, the, uh, the thing that I find amazing about this is that uh, when, when the artists were talking about this style of painting, which came out of a workshop, which JD had helped facilitate um, and uh, and mate, I don't know if you're talking about it, JD, but the the works done in Yalata in 2016 uh, that that found their way into Black Mist Burnt Country. Uh, the, the thing that amazes me about this particular one is uh, when when the artists and Nima Smart and Rita Bryan took the lead lead on this, were asked what they were depicting here, they said life lifted into the sky. And, and all those, those lines, those little dashes of paint within the bomb, um, to them represent uh, plants and animals literally lifted into the sky. Um, in uh, nuclear arts or atomic arts generally, and, and certainly in uh, plays, songs, um, radio work and so on, there's, there's a question that inevitably arises, and, and it's this, where do you put the bomb? Um, does the bomb appear at the start of a play or it, does it appear at the end of a radio piece? Where does the explosion go off? Um, and uh, we were fortunate enough to work with a Japanese artist, Yukio Kawano, who had a very different answer to that. Um, her, uh, among her works are these amazing um, soft sculptures uh, she wanted a silent bomb um, that couldn't go off, quite the opposite. Um, she makes these from uh, her grandmother's kimonos and sews them together with her own hair um, to make a point about the, the passage of genetic modification for Hiroshima survivors, of which she is one, uh, down the generations. Um, the, a, a point about how generations pass the story on. And this is Fat Man hanging in the Tendania uh, Gallery in South Australia. Others have um, said, well, 
when thinking about where the bomb fits, um, there's a need to look at the, the overall context in a contemporary way. And these are the, the bomb sculptures. They're, they're each about 40 centimetres high um, by uh, Warren Ebay Paul from Yalata, uh, who, who did a fourth in his series that is the uh, Fukushima um, wave, the tsunami. Uh, saying that uh, that is the contemporary context of the bomb. Um, another artist we work with, uh, and this will be a bit of a tour initially through um, the range of projects that came out of, of um, what was called the Nuclear Futures Program. Uh, another artist was Gordon Murray from the, the UK who had interviewed a number of atomic survivors um, whose um, parents or grandparents had served in um, the British military at the time of the tests. And um, Gordon made a series of radio poems, extended poems, 20 to 25 minutes, um, and uh, put those together for um, playing on the, the BBC. And uh, at, at the same time, asked those um, atomic survivors to uh, come up with imagery um, that related to their uh, poems. And, and this is uh, an example of that, which I think is pretty amazing um, artwork by uh, one of the veterans uh, or so atomic survivors uh, from veteran families. Um, and uh, I, I put it there for another reason, just to, to emphasize the, the kind of um, art making that has taken place uh, in the form of community arts and cultural development, where the there, there, there may be a visiting artist working in conjunction with atomic survivor community members. And uh, the, this is the kind of thing that can emerge from it. Uh, Multi-arts and, and with that amazing piece by a veteran. Okay, and, and so um, I, I don't have time to talk through <clears throat> everything we did for Nuclear Futures, but um, if you're not familiar with it, um, we we put together a rather extensive documentation of it in um, uh, an issue of Unlikely Journal for Creative Arts. And so you can find all kinds of things about um, our program there. And uh, behind each of those plates is a, um, a set of um, interviews, webisodes, documentations, um, analytical papers, and so on uh, about that whole program. But I'm going to move move on, and um, I can talk more about nuclear futures later if there's time. Okay, so I, I want to spend the rest of this time, and I'm just going to do a check. What time do I have to end, Alexander? It's 17 I'm minutes. About 10, 12 minutes in. So okay. another, 10, another, another 10 or 12 minutes. All right. 10, 12, okay. Yeah. 10, 10. So in the second half, um, I'm going to do a, uh, put, a, put a focus on performance art, atomic art that is performance, and, and start by um, mentioning this very important project um, that was uh, led by Lynette Walworth and initiated by the Morgan family uh, from the Matu tribe in, in um, the far east of Western Australia, if that makes sense. Uh, a project that um, uh, used uh, 360 degree filming uh, and immer immersive technology, um, virtual reality, so that the audience wearing glasses was able to really be there with Nari Morgan as, as he told his story, which included the experience of uh, the bomb, the mailing the bomb. And um, in our uh, Nuclear Futures program, we, um, we did a different sort of immersive um, performance art, uh, placing um, uh, people inside a large cylindrical arena, which is three metres high and about eight metres across, and projecting onto it a, um, uh, two different films that um, were in one case developed with the nuclear veterans community and in, and in the other case with, with Gurani um, developed with the Yalata community. 
And um, I said it's performance because there's there's both performance within the film and uh, in the films, and they they star the the, the storytellers uh, from Yalata in the case of Gurani, and some of the nuclear veterans in the case of the other film, Ten Minutes to Midnight. Um, but apart from that, um, and uh, sorry, these these images are from the um, from Gurani. They show how the film was stitched together in. Um, usually three different images um, shown in, in the round. Um, and it's essentially the migration story telling how people, uh, the, the, the people who became known as the Marling uh moved away from the Uldia mission um, at around about the same time that British nuclear testing took off at um, EMU uh, and Maralinga. Uh, and that's, that's a big historical debate about exactly the order of events and the motivations of, of the various waves of migration. Nonetheless, in the minds of the, um, the Anangu people at Yalata, they certainly connect the, the bomb with, with the closure of the Uldia mission. And that's the story that's told in Gurani. Um, of them uh, coming down from the Uldia mission to make a new settlement at the Alata on very different country that was not the red dirt of Maralinga, but uh, a, a white soil country that supported this kind of vegetation. And um, the other way in which these uh, were performances is that the, the audience sat within the cylinder uh, and in that way became performers in their own way. And the reactions of, of the person next to you or the person that you could see across the other side of the cylinder um, were just as important as the action going on the screen. And these are just a few of uh, the, the shots of how that um, was experienced. This time the film is 10 minutes to midnight. We called the dummy in the middle with the gas mask on uh, Mrs. Titterton. And the, the film uh, is an allusion to the, uh, the doomsday clock. Um, optimistically, we placed it at 10 minutes to midnight. Um, I don't think it's still there. And this is, this is back to Gurani. Uh, I said before that land rights was one of the political contexts and as part of the, the story of Maralinga and of, of the migration away from it, um, the, the, the bid for control and uh, return of land rights um, to the, the Maralinga people uh, was certainly a prominent element. Okay, so uh, meanwhile, um, I, I don't want to give the impression that, that all atomic art um, follows the kind of political line that, that um, you'd certainly have assumed that, that I would take um, uh, or that I think the majority of um, atomic artists, especially in Australia, take. So I just want to um, throw in, uh, by way of qualification, the way in which um, atomic art, art has also um, been put to, uh, put to use uh, by, by those in favour of nuclear power and, and not least through a, a series of um, very, very large murals uh, on, on uh, cooling towers in France, uh, rivalling the kind of uh, murals that, that we see on wheat silos in Australia. Uh, and, and here's one of them, uh, the, the water carrier. Um, and, and also, um, with a with a bit of a tilt to um, two people well known to the HPS family, um, uh, I wanted to mention um, the work uh, by Philip Baxter uh, in in writing um, what may ironically perhaps be one of Australia's first atomic plays, uh, the the day the sun rose in the west. And I've put the cast list up here because it's the quickest way I could think of for you to get just a sense of what Baxter was writing about. Um, and uh, one of the HPS people I'm referring to is Philip Gissing, who did his PhD on Baxter. 
and um, found himself in the rather strange position of being the person that put this play into Baxter's own archive. Baxter himself refused to do that and Gissing got his family to agree that it should sit within the archive. So Baxter kind of disowned the play in some ways. Um, and then the other, the other book I'm referring to, which has um, some very interesting artwork within it, um, is, is Brian Martin's Nuclear Nights, um, which is a book about Baxter and uh, Ernest Titterton. Uh, so uh, anyway, the, the, the point is not all atomic art uh, adopts an anti-nuclear uh, stance. Okay, so half a life in, in the, the bit of time that's remaining um, was what uh, Alexander, you originally asked me to talk about and I've left myself only five minutes to do that. I hope you don't mind. But um, back in 2003, um, uh, inspired actually by Lynette Walworth, uh, who I'd worked with at the Adelaide Festival, um, I and a group of uh, students started work on a, an oral history project that became a verbatim play. We had many impulses, many inspirations, and this is just one of them. A British nuclear veteran named John Walden had kept these amazing little diaries and on the 25th of uh, September um, noted up early at or up at 4.15 to roadside, um, bomb at 10 a.m., flash and blast. Um, so, uh, so Walden's diaries were uh, one way in which we started to um, piece together stories from nuclear veterans at the at the at the grassroots um, and uh, eventually turn it into a play um, I won't go through all these you can just I just wanted them flashed up they probably came up this morning the, just the the other very concrete piece of um, history that was an impulse to half a life was the series of tests um, talked about extensively by the, the Royal Commission, which was also something that inspired us. And, and then uh, the, the politics that we encountered back in 2003 was the, um, the, the build up to what was known as the Clark Report, which was all about the, um, the rights of veterans, the, um, the possibility that they would get a different sort of health card and the, uh, the travesty that saw a lot of nuclear veterans declared ineligible for such health support because they had not served in what was classified as an active war zone. Um, so that was the campaign which Half a Life uh, dovetailed into and uh, the play became one way that the uh, nuclear veterans associations publicised their, their case both in Australia and in uh, the UK. Um, we set our play specifically um, around the Taranaki balloon test, though it ranges in, in its time from before that through to the modern day. And um, that, that was partly because John Walden was at the Taranaki test uh, with his um, trusty box brownie um, and made literally hundreds of um, photographs of, of the nuclear veterans in the field. Um, and this is the so-called balloon unit getting ready for um, the, the Taranaki burst, which was uh, uh, hauled upwards in uh, using old barrage balloons. Um, this photo was another important piece of inspiration and um, its content appears in the play Half a Life. Um, Rick Johnson, who was president of the Australian Nuclear Veterans Association, um, kept supplying us with images that he would always say fell off the back of a truck. I don't know who the author of this is. But um, Rick Johnson told us that this shows that this is the evidence that the men were never looked after. He said this shows men working in a hot zone, in other words, working in a part of the range where the, um, the previous bomb had gone off and they'd been asked to prepare the field for the next bomb. And importantly, uh, they're working on that machinery with, with no specialised protective clothing at all. And Walden himself um, had someone take this photograph of him 
and his demeanor, his attitude, um, his body language in that particular shot of him walking on the road um, was another form of inspiration for, for Half a Life. I'll leave you to um, make what you want of that. Um, and so um, we put Half a Life together. It was a verbatim play built from um, transcribed interviews um, taken across a, a microphone. Um, it had various iterations in the UK and here in Australia. Um, it, it had a different title when it played at the Etalong Beach War Memorial Club, uh, namely Maralinga. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a play which is, is still being worked on. There's a group of us who are working on um, uh, uh, an update of Half a Life. Uh, some of the language in it, and I, we don't have time to go through this. This is one of the, the widows, her testimony talking about her husband getting sick. He got thickness in the throat, not being able to swallow it. it used to come, all come out the stoma tube and then it would back up and come out the nose. It was terrible, poor bugger. Um, and, and on she goes telling this terrible story of how her husband uh, became ill, how she had to look after him and how eventually he died. And, and that kind of uh, story is, is certainly prominent in Half a Life. Uh, but the, the only other piece I've got time to show you is an extract from the scene where the, um, uh, the characters in the play are talking about what they saw when they witnessed the bomb. Um, I'll just jump into it at some point there. You actually see daylight through your hands, straight through the back of your head, the light, the flash. And he said his fingers, it looked like an x-ray, the bones in your fingers. And even with your back turned and your hands over your face, it was just like as though you had no hands, etc. So the, the play also has that kind of expression of what the, the men were thinking about the technology itself. And I'll just read the final one. It was, it was just this great big billowing cloud with all the colors inside there, the reds and the oranges and blacks. Yeah, even though it was midnight, it was, it was just, and then they fire rockets, you see, they fire rockets from each side at an angle like that. And they can work out by photographs how high it's going, like a real huge thunderstorm. And these rockets going up, oh yeah, it was beautiful. Of course it was. And so you get the, um, the irony, I suppose, that uh, the men saw the bombs as the, the fruits of their, of their own labor and experienced the, the full awe uh, of the bomb, uh, despite what, uh, and then in contrast, what went on to happen to many of them through their um, ill health and changed lives. The, the experiment of, of Maralinga continues to play out. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the local cast of um, Half a Life. Um, the first extract I read to you comes from um, the, the scene in which the, the, the man and his wife are talking and the second extract comes from uh, the, the scene that's represented by the photograph on the, on the right. Okay, so um, I, I just want to say something briefly and I think we probably would come back to this in question time. But, um, uh, today, um, nuclear art, uh, in Australia um, continues to have uh, a number of political focal points, if you like, but undoubtedly the, the, the one that's emerging and is likely to remain very prominent um, concerns the, the new uh, UN treaty, the, the ban treaty. And um, you can see how ICANN has, has um, introduced its own uh, blow up sculpture uh, with a kind of Dr. Strange love feel to it. Um, and uh, some of the, well, uh, quite a number of the artists who've routinely worked on nuclear issues are uh, starting to um, pitch their tent alongside ICANN um, and uh, to produce work that's related to it. Okay, and I just wanna finish with a, uh, a pitch. Um, there is to be a, uh, an exhibition next year, postponed twice now due to COVID, at um, Tin Sheds. Um, 
uh, called Art in the Nuclear Age from Hiroshima to the Present Day. This is being organised through the Department of Japanese Studies at Sydney University. Um, uh, Yasuko Claremont is the prime mover there. And um, that will be on 7th of April to the 14th of May. So um, I'm just going to finish by putting um, uh, a couple of uh, questions up for discussion. And I took it, Alexander, to be the case that there, there would be time for a bit of discussion. Um, I've been talking about the, uh, the creative arts problem of where to put the bomb, but um, I think it warrants some discussion about um, how, how atomic arts uh, has portrayed the bomb and what the, the changing uh, context for doing that might be and what it might demand of artists. I think one thing we can say is that in, um, in, the, uh, in the realm of uh, atomic performing arts, uh, to borrow uh, an approach taken by Joseph Mas Masco, the anthropologist who studied um, uh, the New Mexican situation in, the, in a fantastic book called Nuclear Borderlands. Uh, I think um, in, the, in the sort of plays and other performance artworks that I've been talking about, People are setting out to perform the uncanny, uh, the, the nuclear uncanny, as Masco writes about it, um, borrowing that that is a Freudian term, um, and meaning the sense, the profound sense of unease that society feels in the in the shadow of of mushroom clouds, and and with the uncertainties about the um, uh, the prosecution of the nuclear agenda, both um, so-called civil and military, um, uh, creating a sense where uh, we continue to be unsure how that's going to play out. Um, I don't have time to talk about suspended doubt in, in detail, but it is, I think, a worthy discussion point about whether there are different types of creative art um, and how it changes when the focus is from the community itself. Uh, as opposed to um, an artist who, who has their own vision and um, seeks to implement that through their own artwork separate from uh, a community. And uh, I think what I'm getting at there is that if communities are involved, the creative arts process is one in which um, artists, scientists, communities together will process um, their views on, on the bomb uh, in, a, in circumstances where they suspend their doubts in each other, allowing different perspectives to come in together and, uh, and therefore create new knowledge that um, is represented in the artworks themselves, which become statements of that knowledge. That was the sense that we had in South Australia when the Royal Commission was running, uh, that we were contributing to knowledge uh, that was relevant to the decision making uh, that was going on at that time um, about both um, waste dumps and, and also the, the other propositions that the Royal Commission um, was considering. And the final image, Kukapadi and Gurawiya, is the, uh, the well-known sign from, um, from Maralinga. Um, in Pitanjara, it, it simply says, um, hunting and cooking is okay, Kukapalya, but Gurawiya means you can't make your home there, uh, which, which seems to encapsulate the state of play at Marilinga. Um, it's still contaminated. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. <clears throat> So we might follow the first session and, and just have the discussion at the end. So I've made a note of those points and we can come back to them. Um, I'd like to introduce um, JD. JD Mittman is a curator and manager of collections at Burringer, the Dandenong Rangers Cultural Centre at Upway, Victoria, and produced the award-winning National Touring Exhibition, Black Miss Burnt Country, 2016-2019. Uh, so JD, if you'd like to... Do you have, you have slides as well? Yes, I do. Thanks, yeah. Alexander. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm just going to you know, share my screen here. 
Uh, and um, thanks, Paul. I mean, it seems odd kind of now to come, um, you know, sort of full circle again and dive back into art. I think your discussion points, um, we need to come back at the end and um, perhaps, you know, Alexander, you can throw that slide up again um, because I think they really kind of sum up nicely kind of what we're trying to encapsulate here. Now, can you see my, um, uh, my slideshow? Excellent. All right. Um, well, let me first um, acknowledge that I'm on Wurundjeri country, um, the Wurundjeri of the Kulin nations, and I pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and in extension also to the Pigeon Jana new people of South Australia who's, um, on whose country um, the events played out um, that this presentation refers to, and you know, uh, that was previously referred to as well, as well as um, I would like to acknowledge all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be attending. So I'm J.D. Mitman. I'm the curator um, at, at Barringer, um, uh, the Dandong Rangers Cultural Center. Um, we are located on the outskirts of Melbourne at you know, roughly 45 um, minutes um, from the CBD to the east. So we are um, a, um, a multifaceted art center with galleries, theater, artist studios, um, and what seems like um, to be a big operation, actually, I only has three full-time staff and a part-time and a handful of part-timers. So this project that um, I'll be presenting about here, you know, was really quite a big deal for us, so to speak. Um, um, uh, it, you know, afforded a lot of resources. It was quite a lengthy pro project as well, because I started setting out um, with the research in 2014 um, with the idea when my former boss then came to me and said, well, how about we do a little, you know, do a touring exhibition again. We do have a small collection of artwork here, predominantly indigenous art uh, and some um, carvings and masks from New Guinea. Um, so it was sort of, um, you know, kind of thrown to me. And, um, you know, what seemed like a small idea at the beginning became quite a big balloon. I think my boss would have shied away from, um, you know, executing this had he known um, what uh, I was <laughs> about to unleash. Um, so the tour was jointly funded by Australia Council for the Arts and um, the Australian Government's Visions of Australia program. Um, and as you can see, it toured um, you know, 10 venues across the state. Now the nature of Visions of Australia is that you have to go to remote and regional um, venues. So you can't just stick around the big cities and, and get all the attention. Um, which was great because it also exposed us to very different demographics and of course the nature of the different venues had it that the exhibition always looked quite different and, and it was quite a challenge to make it work in all the places. Um, I took the time to travel to all the venues prior to the exhibition and also during the exhibition in order um, to help with the install, with public programming, to be there, um, you know, questions and answers and, and the like. So I, I won't really speak much about the history of atomic testing in Australia. I'll really kind of give you a tour de force through the exhibition and, and show you some of the artworks and why they were se selected. Um, uh, so bear with me on this one. Now, this is the work that actually set it all um, in motion. Um, Jonathan Kamenjaras Br Brown's work, large, um, a large canvas, as you can see, Marilinga before the atomic test. This is the work that I refer to that is in our collection. Um, and when I saw this work, I was, of course, um, you know, intrigued by it because it also quite quickly posed the question, well, if there's before, you know, what does after look like? Um, so I set out to kind of do some research, but we, we come back to Jonathan Brown in, in, in a moment, just to give you a little bit um, of my own background. So I'm, I'm German. I grew up in Germany in the 1980s, sort of at the height of the um, Cold War, and I should probably say West Germany, to be more precise. Um, I had um, grandparents in East Berlin, uh, in, in, sorry, in West Berlin, so we we're always traveling through the East, you know, the enemy country, if you like, across the, um, the Iron Curtain um, to visit. Um, so the 1980s, of course, you know, um, with nuclear weapons to be stationed in Europe and Pershing II's in, in, in Germany, unleashed a huge protest movement. Um, and sort of, you know, in my high school years, I was sort of exposed to this. 
Um, of course, you know, the, the question is where, when you tell a story of this nature, where do you start? And in some ways, of course, it all starts, you know, with the atomic bomb, um, you know, being used, you know, for the first time. Um, so initially, kind of, I thought we are telling a story here that, you know, would have a very narrow focus, but it became quite quickly clear that there was more to say about the topic rather than telling the story of Marilinga. So I went through the effort to kind of go a little bit further back art historically, if you like, to kind of weave a concept of, you know, how different artists had engaged with, you know, the atomic bomb and it, particular the British atomic tests in Australia, which was my focus. Um, and, and this probably you know, ha has already been pointed out, but it's, it's a good reminder also to, 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 um, to note, of course, that um, uh, Australian war um, artists had, of course, been in, in Hiroshima here, Regin Reginald wrote, um, and had documented, of course, the impact of the bombs, you know, that had of course on, on the city. So um, I took this as a starting point um, in order to explain that here is an artistic um, you know, tradition, if you like, or you know, a, a field that had already origins in 1945. Um, now, um, Liz and, and Paul had kind of you know, listed all the tests, so we're kind of you know, well aware now kind of what the geographical map looks like. I tried, you know, to to kind of keep the focus narrow and and in that sense, sort of focused on Marilinga, even though um, the works appeared in the exhibition that kind of expanded the view a little, and that was, you know, really sort of to give audience a kind of an understanding, sort of what what what, what was on, is on stake. Uh, one of the great motivators for, for this um, exhibition exhibition was that I quite early in the piece when I talked to people you know, about this kind of found um, that, you know, in general, there was not a great deal of knowledge about atomic testing in Australia, um, in particular on the younger generation, but, you know, even an older generation um, kind of seemed not to know a lot. Um, and so here, of course, you know, um, the question is also is, you know, was the Marilinga story not perhaps, you know, part of the hidden histories and in some ways the exhibition then kind of became a way of sort of um, shedding some, some light on it. Now, um, like I said, you know, the, the idea was really to kind of, you know, create an arc here and to see how over the last um, seven decades since 1945, um, Australian artists had sort of responded to the atomic theme. Um, here we have a work by Sidney Noland, who was not at all really politically engaged, um, if you like, um, certainly not, you know, an activist or anti-nuclear in any sorts, but um, nevertheless, he kind of referred to, you know, the tests in his famous Central Desert series after he flew over the country and, you know, was quite intrigued also to kind of learn about indigenous um, life and culture as he did. Um, so I think we can safely say that here a political statement, you know, in somewhat a subtle way was made. He actually kind of painted this painting in when he was in England. Um, and so I, my assumption is, and that's sort of what the research showed, that he actually kind of got news from the tests in Australia through the British media and um, kind of felt in, inclined to, to add sort of the mushroom cloud on the horizon later in, 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 in the work. Um, it's probably fair to say that um, one should not forget that the 1950s, you know, in particular, of course, also here in Australia, were sort of um, uh, an era where, you know, the atomic age was in its infancy and was quite welcomed. You know, there was quite a bit of support um, for atomic, um, for, the, for the atomic tests um, when they became known here. And um, in some ways, I think that reflects when looking at the artwork from that era, there's actually not a lot that kind of makes, you know, a clear statement one way or the other. Um, more interestingly, though, um, you find that the next generation of artists, you know, those that were sort of born in the 1950s and sort of, you know, in the 1970s, you know, late 1970s, perhaps, or, you know, um, uh, kind of lived through um, era of progressive ideas, um, kind of took to the topic quite differently. 
Um, and of course, you know, here with Kate Downhill, you know, she's the daughter of a veteran, um, kind of explored, you know, the topic. But it is fair to say that, you know, much of the work that was actually produced, you know, if not, you know, on the anniversary of Hiroshima Day, um, certainly really only kind of appeared after um, the story of the British atomic tests were kind of publicized through the Royal Commission findings um, of, of the, the, the actual you know, commission sittings and then, you know, of course, the report later on. Um, so, you know, the majority of works that we kind of see really kind of are actually more of a recent recent date. And quite interestingly, there's a number of, um, you know, artists that come to Australia from other places that kind of, you know, um, made a statement there. Um, none of these really actually kind of, you know, took, took the story, you know, made that their lives work. It's more individual pieces. Um, now, Yami Lessa has already been mentioned earlier, and, and of course, he was instrumental in, in, in as a land rights activist, as a victim to um, the, the so-called Black Mist, um, and, and of course, also as someone that, as a key witness, um, appeared in the um, Royal Commission and and um, and, and gave his statement. Um, so, um, before we come back to Jonathan Brown, it's probably fair to say that you know um, the first step in in, the, in this project was actually to kind of go and consult with the community to kind of seek permission whether that. Um, whether telling the story, um, you know, was in their interest, you know, whether I could go out and, and, and do this. And so that started early in that piece. And I was quite privileged actually also to kind of meet Yami Lester, um, uh, who, who um, gave his support for the project. So that sort of sets, set wheels in motion. But <clears throat> the question, of course, still was sort of how to kind of narrow down on this. And initially, I kind of thought, you know, Jonathan, Tim, Jonathan Kamenjara Brown would probably kind of the man to tell the story. He has um, certainly created the largest body of work. Um, he was a member of um, the Stolen Generations. He grew up with a white foster family in, in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, he was quite privileged, went to private, uh, to public, um, sorry, to private schools. Um, and eventually kind of, you know, created, a, you know, this, this body um, of works under the mentorship um, or the tutelage, if you like, of, of Neil McLeod, who's a, you know, um, um, uh, successful photographer, um, a local resident here, um, and, and, and art collector, who kind of took Jonathan under his wing. So some of the works actually were produced not far from us here in Neil's studio in Tacoma. Um, and in fact, actually a couple also here, um, you know, on, on, on our site. Um, now, Jonathan, of course, being a member of the Stolen Generation, um, you know, um, being removed from his community at the age of two, um, didn't speak the language. Um, so when he returned back um, to his community in Yalata to seek out his family, um, of course, he didn't you speak the language, um, he, he wasn't familiar with the country, um, neither was he familiar with, with, um, with um, um, law and, 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 and law. Um, so he actually didn't have the rights to kind of, um, he wasn't introduced um, into, into, um, into some of the culture, so he hadn't, hadn't um, acquired the rights to kind of um, present certain um, you know, iconic, um, you know, um, designs. So what Jonathan did is sort of he kind of, you know, painted, you know, these kind of designs, but then covered them up. And that was also in a way of saying that they had been destroyed uh, beyond recognition. So it was a, the, the destruction of country that, you know, he, he symbolized in this, in these works. Um, so, so he kind of documented quite, quite, you know, on, on the basis of you know, his research and, and the Royal Commission papers, you know, um, the events of, of, of Maralinga. Um, but it's fair to say that it was a very, very traumatic um, experience for him. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, the, his story really kind of stands out, you know, as an example that is probably, um, you know, um, the case can be taken as a case for, for many other indigenous people it's there. Um, he kind of went through, you know, this act of um, nuclear colonialism. You know, um, the fact that there were, um, you know, dis displaced and disposed of, um, dispossessed of their country, 
um, you know, that they had no access to their traditional lands, um, that they couldn't go there for ceremony, they could not even travel through them. Um, and this was from the period, you know, when the British announced the test program until, you know, the last parcel of land was handed back, you know, by the Defense Department in 2014. Um, so a larger section of the land had already kind of, you know, been given by, back by um, the state, um, South Australian state government, you know, native title kind of um, legislation in the 1980s. But um, of course, the, the essential parts, the forward area, Maralinga village, um, were not included in this. Now, here's the painting that Paul um, alluded to earlier. Um, you know, um, I was very keen to kind of not just, you know, have, you know, tell, you know, the story from my perspective through the works of of, of artists, but you know, I, I, I was very keen to involve the community in some shape or form, you know, to tell their own story. Um, and it almost didn't come about, as often is with indigenous community, they sit on something very, very long until the last minute. And um, eventually we were lucky and, 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 and I was quite delighted, you know, that this large canvas was produced, which really sort of sums up the, the story of, um, um, you know, um, living in the traditional country, you know, being rounded up by, by the army and, and driven to trucks to the south, you know, which, you know, was the Arlata mission. Um, very different country, not sandstone country, it's limestone country down there, it's harsh on the feet, the earth is grow, gray and, and, and the weather cold. So a lot of people kind of tried to get away and, and, and again were rounded up and, and, and back, you know, um, brought back to Yalata, which eventually then became the community's kind of home, if you like. Um, you know, here in the center of the painting, you can also see the Transcontinental Railway, and of course the two bl blue circles are the Oldia Soak, um, which was a permanent water hole and therefore for importance for the Pichinjara and new people in the area that traveled long distances actually to get to this water. Um, it was eventually depleted by um, the Transcontinental Railway, um, and and the the area sanded up and hence became in 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 inhabitable. Um, another artist that made a statement, um, you know, about the events uh, is Sharia Stanley, as an elderly lady in Erna Bella, um, and um, when approached, um, you know. She kind of clearly said, oh, I don't really want to talk about this anymore. I don't want to paint it about, about this anymore. We have done this for decades. Nothing has ever changed. Um, I, I rather want to paint something, you know, beautiful and, you know, bush foods and, you know, ceremony, which she kind of did. Um, and then when you kind of look at, of course, you know, uh, the painting, you see all those bones um, and, 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 and the, the curvy white lines. Um, being snakes invading, you know, the camps where the people are sitting around the fire and, and having their food. Um, the, the snakes um, symbolizing the black mist um, uh, coming, coming in and of course, you know, the bones being, you know, the bones that the, you know, the traditional healers would use to kind of try to fend off um, that evil spirit. So this story of Puyu Black Mist refers to um, the black mist that Jeremy Lester talked about, you know, this mysterious kind of black cloud that in, after the um, first totem test um, hovered over the country into, in, in sort of a northeastern direction and affected, you know, um, Yami Lester's family and, 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 and um, um, community um, very badly. Now, some of the works interesting uh, that I found interestingly also kind of show, you know, a, a distinct kind of, um, you know, influence uh, often by white facilitators, artists, and in this case, Lance Atkinson, um, a Mildura Yota Yota man that had come down to Oak Valley and did a painting workshops there for, for the local community. And here Hilda Medieu and Jeff McKema had kind of painted, um, you know, the, the mushroom cloud kind of from their perspective. When you look, of course, closely at the painting, you can see the mushroom cloud is almost like the same shape of Lance's work. And, and so you can see, you know, there's a direct kind of in influence at stake. Here's an urban artist, Black Douglas. Um, he's a Sydney-based artist. He, you know, the, 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 the clouds that he um, put in the painting here are one for each 
um, Australian Prime Minister since the tests that have not kind of um, um, acted, you know, um, in terms of you know com compensating the communities um, that were affected. Um, and of course, you now talking talking about um, you know the, the wider response, and of course the white art is kind of um, you know to to the topic. Um, you know, you, we find very, very different approaches, predominantly under more contemporary artists where you know, there's painting and sculpture and photography and new media, um, you know, quite, quite a rich tapestry of different, different um, interpretations, um, you know, as Paul kind of alluded to earlier. Um, now, what is interesting also, you know, of course, in, in the context um, of, of um, you know, bringing this exhibition um, together was kind of to see, you know, that obviously this is a regional issue here, Pam Debenham, you have a very iconic and well-known um, uh, screen print no nukes in the Pacific, um, you know, where there's in the 90s was a you know, large protest movement here, I'm sure you're all aware, you know, about the French protests, at, you know, a, a test at Mororoa. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, um, it, it always kind of, you know, came back to that, you know, this is, this is an indigenous story. At the, at the heart of this, you know, there, there is, you know, the indigenous experience. And for that matter, it was important, you know, um, that um, the indigenous voice kind of spoke, you know, directly to your audiences. So, I mean, obviously, I kind of, you know, acquired a bit of knowledge about, you know, what had happened. Uh, and can't probably speak confidently about it, but you know it made a huge difference um, if you have someone like Nima Smart here, um, you know, a community elder, um, you know, chairperson of the community, kind of speak from her experience. And and of course, you know, um, um, you know, this you know indigenous experience here, you know, summed up here by uh, by Mima, kind of really is is you know was what at the heart and the essence of, of this exhibition, you know, that, you know, I had, the test had not just caused all this harm, but, you know, here were ongoing um, considerations and, you know, this being an ongoing, um, ongoing issue. Um, just, you know, um, to kind of sum this up, um, um, you know, you, you can see here, um, works from the exhibition um what was really interesting was you know the, the the reactions that we kind of got in various um venues so there were additional materials that we um uh, made available an exhibition catalog um and and um um a, a digital kind of resource with a timeline we have a website um and it was astounding to realize you know how few people kind of really knew um, about this you know there was a great hunger to kind of take um, you know all this on and learn about this um, the responses were quite astounding in the way that you know people were moved to tears um, um, they were shocked um, they were appalled um, you know many didn't know that Menzies had you know almost single single-handedly kind of made the decision for these tests you know to be allowed in, in Australia um, and in particular, under a younger generation, you know, there, there, there was, um, you know, there, there was no knowledge, um, um, you know, really about these events. Um, a few veterans came forward as well. This gentleman um, at the Gold Coast, you know, explained that he had flown through um, uh, in a Lincoln bomber through the cloud twice and had been the only surviving member of his crew because he was the only one that at the time had worn a mask. Um, so it was kind of really interesting to kind of um, be present at the exhibition and kind of get a sense to kind of how people were taking uh, to this. We invited you know, young and um, um, visitors as well as older ones to kind of you know, do origami cranes um, and really kind of to draw people further in, in, into, um, in, into the topic. Um, you know, um, overall, um, we had, you know, at over a hundred thousand uh, visitors in uh, at the ten venues. Um, you know, much of that with the help um, of the Australian National Museum in Canberra, where um, the exhibition um, had a stop. 
Um, and it was always gratifying to see, you know, that, um, you know, when, when entire school classes came kind of through and kind of, you know, learned about this part of Australian history. So, um, you know, this is the catalog that, that, um, that we published um, and um, um, a, a specific uh, educational resource for years nine to 12. Um, an extensive website um, with, with um, um, additional resources, uh, history, timeline, um, background on the artists, um, and so on. Um, and even, um, you know, amongst the public programs, um, you know, that we had um, organized a tour to Maralinga with some of the artists um, that, that had, um, had not been there. Um, so a site visit, um, as you like. Um, so, um, at the end of the day, um, uh, the, the tour almost traveled for three years around the country, and it's probably fair to say that there was interest, you know, um, you know among in the community for it to go longer. Um, that's certainly not part of, of um, um, this arrangement and funding arrangements. Um, but of course, you know, um, I personally kind of got a sense, you know, that that here is a chapter of Australian history um, that that you know we had quasi opened up um, for people to um, learn about, um, um, where um, there was great community um, interest. And in fact, you know, what really kind of transported all this also was the fact, and, and somewhat also changed my role as a curator and all this, you know, was the, 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 the fact that I realized that um, um, I wasn't just a curator, sort of, you know, I was transporting the story, but, you know, I had to kind of come off the fence, really, and, um, and be somewhat more proactive in the way, and kind of telling the story, um, you know, that, you know, um, why this was still relevant, you know, um, why, you know, nuclear, that nuclear weapons are still around, um, that there's continued contamination at the lands in, in Marilinga and the test sites, um, that there's an ongoing debate on a nuclear waste dump. And how Paul, you know, as Paul had already pointed out, um, you know, these things are somewhat connected. I mean, good timing also had it that, um, um, i just jump forward here, that, you know, at the time of the exhibition, of course, no negotiations were um, going on at the United Nations about a treaty to ban um, nuclear weapons. And um, by all accounts, the testimony of um, um, Australian indigenous um, test survivors played a huge role um, uh, in these negotiations and had an enormous impact on, on the diplomats in the room. Um, here we have Sue Coleman Heseldine, Pokotha, lady from the far west in South Australia, but Yami Lester's daughter, um, uh, Karina Lester, was present um, at times as well. And um, um, Sue, um, Auntie Sue really kind of summed it up nicely here because in a, in a way, you know, this is, this is shared history, it's our shared future, and this is why this is um, important um, for us. So it was interesting to see that there was this kind of parallel story unfolding um, in the background while the exhibition was on the way. And of course, as you know, in uh, July 2017, the United Nations overwhelmingly voted for a nuclear ban treaty which has come in force earlier this year. Um, and ICANN has received the Nobel Peace Prize um, for um, the sustained campaign and, and effort. Um, just to close up here, I want to point out that of course, you know, other, um, um, you know, perhaps the exhibition in some ways triggered, you know, other, um, um, other um, arts projects as well. And I was just want to point out two here, Johannes Gass is a lady born in Woomera, uh, she's a glass blower. And over the past few years um, has quite produced quite a number of works um, that, that tackle, um, you know, the, the, the story of her people, um, you know, the contamination of land, um, uh, the, the um, um, and and the the health effects that the test brought um, uh, um, um, with them, as well as you know um, um, the, these these fantastic kind of um, um a spear 
and shield installation that was part of uh, the Tandy Art Festival in 2017. Um, so there's an ongoing, um, you know, um, th th there's projects ongoing in the community that still kind of, you know, we've come come back to tell this story from from different angles and keep keep the um, the discussion um, going. Um, and I think this this is warranted because you know the problem is hasn't gone away and will not go away. And, and when we look at, of course. Um, the Maralinga lands. Um, we, we will know that you know um, here. You know we, we have sites that will be you know um, contaminated for you know generations to come, despite you know um, you know uh, an effort to kind of clean them up um, to some extent. But you know that that's that's something perhaps you know can be d discussed in another forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teddy. Um, I'll just get you to close the slide so we can all pop back into the. My mouse has disappeared. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? I'll do this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. So we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, should we start if anyone has any questions and then maybe, yep, Adam. <coughs> Excuse me. Terrific presentations, really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I guess, um, well, I'll start with a question for Alexander. In relation to the Hiroshima panels, when you talked about there being criticisms of the exhibition by Australians while the exhibition was touring, do you have any idea, or can you tell us what what were those criticisms and what were they based on? Uh, yes. Uh, so basically, um, they got what they deserved. Um, the the images themselves. So in terms of the art criticism, the images were dismissed as derivative, and you know. Um, like the for the bulletin, but the, the, sorry, the, I was more talking about yeah, like basically letters from returned servicemen or families of returned servicemen saying you know we shouldn't be showing this. Look what the Japanese did, um, and yeah, like the, the reference to Changi there, for example, was talked about in some letters. Um, the other and and the idea that the pictures themselves were sort of too horrific. Um, you know, they were sort of, uh, you know, I mean, they are pretty horrific to this because they're very large. Looking at them on the screen, really, you really don't get it, but they're so big, um, you know, and they're, they're really horrible, I mean, <laughs> on one level. Um, so the idea that they were sort of, bar in a way, barbaric images. And the other one being, um, the other letter I can recall, yeah, here we go. That the Japanese were allies of Hitler, and yeah, they they only got what they deserved. So there were various such letters published, letters to the editor, but the overwhelming um, response was positive in the sense that I mean, it's not a hundred percent. I still haven't can't a hundred percent say what happened at the National Gallery of Australia. I, uh, there is a report. Very most of this research I was in Japan, and I haven't been yet to get this report. But whether there's anything in the National Gallery's own report. But I mean, they changed their mind and, and showed it because most people were calling for it to be shown. Um, I, I also perhaps could have mentioned on that front that the Sydney exhibition was opened by the former, uh, I think he was governor general, but anyway, he was the um, commander of the Australian British Commonwealth forces in Hiroshima. So, you know, it was certainly, and 1957, remember as well, was the signing of the first commercial treaty post-war between Australia and Japan. So there was a few exhibitions at this time, art exhibitions as a part of a sort of, um, let's be friends again, I guess, uh, and trade recommenced from that previous year. So yeah, that's the basic. <coughs> that's, that's also the year we started selling coal to Japan. Yeah, so the treaty provided the legal basis for that. And that's again, the background to the next, the, the main part of this research is really from here to um, 
that also then start, there was starting to be some, a few preliminary treaties to allow uranium to be sold, although that wasn't possible until nearly another 20 years later. Yeah. Thank you. Any other like questions? Those, uh, I just have a, a, a question for Paul and thank you all of you for incredible presentations this afternoon, really enjoying them. Um, Paul, I'm one who reads the Royal Commission transcript quite a bit and I find it's absolutely filled with human drama and humour and um, sadness and anger. Um, do you draw, in the work that you do, do you draw upon that transcript um, at all for the, the performing arts that you're involved with? Uh, yeah, definitely. Look, I'd, I'd be 100% sure I haven't um, poured over it as much as you would have, Liz. But, um, yeah, I, I was... Um, one of the people who was a mentor in all of this was Jean McSorley, who was Greenpeace's nuclear campaigner in the 1990s. And when I worked at Greenpeace, she was here in Australia and she was the one who impressed upon me the, the importance of a, of a close reading of, of the Royal Commission report. And um, yeah, I've got them in my shelves right here and I find myself referring to them from time to time. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I read them in, a, uh, in one way, I read them because um, uh, there, there's a kind of occupational hazard in, in um, community-based arts that you, uh, you're gathering up the stories of community members. And if those stories are matched by the, um, uh, the so-called official records, it becomes very powerful. Um, if they're not matched by official records, then you've, you've got a controversy that can go either way. I'm not saying official records are always correct, but many times when we were trying to um, uh, secure uh, some authority within what we've been doing, we've matched up what veterans tell us with what's in the Royal Commission, uh, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, I've done a fair bit of that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's, it's quite a story, isn't it, from the Royal Commission? Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Nick? Yeah, I had a question for Paul as well, um, related to, you made a brief mention to the way people read artworks differently at different times. And it's something I've been struck by that, that certain atomic art comes from one era, but is reinterpreted in another. I mean, my favourite example is is the Godzilla movies. I yeah. mean, the Japanese made Godzilla movies in the 1950s after the Bravo test. And mm. it was about how American nuclear testing had created these monsters from the, the ocean and, yeah. and so on. When the Americans remade it as a Hollywood movie in 1988, it was about French nuclear testing that created right. the monster. Yeah. And the monster came and attacked uh, the United States. Mm. And the heroes were an American journalist and a French DGSE agent who was trying to cover it up, but then turned into a good guy. Um, but it just was fascinating that, that what began as a Japanese interpretation of American nuclear testing became an American interpretation of French nuclear testing, um, yeah. where the Americans wanted to whitewash their involvement. And I, I wonder whether you've had parallels within Australia about people reinterpreting old art in new ways um, that resonate in that sort of way. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think it happens all the time and, and it's one of the reasons I was um, so fascinated with what Alexander was talking about because uh, that, that period at the end of the 50s going into the 60s was transformative in terms of uh, Australians' relationship with Japan. Um, and uh, the story Alexander's telling is about one of shifting interpretation of, of artwork. Um, the, the artist I mentioned, Yukio Kawano, who works with her own grandmother's kimonos and her own hair, um, has shown that work in so many different contexts and, and obtained so many different um, responses. And sometimes she, she exhibits them along with a dance troupe that is 
performing. Um, uh, and often that group is put together by a, a local community cast that does workshops. And so uh, it, it, each, each exploration by cast and crew um, delivers a, a different understanding of her cloth bomb sculptures standing in space. So that, that, that's kind of in the, uh, in the finer grain of what you're talking about. Um, and I, I think uh, if, I, if I reflect on um, something like Baxter's play, The Day the Sun Rose in the West, um, it's amazing how that, that, that had some level of credibility to the point where um, NIDA um, conducted some readings of it and Baxter was instrumental in setting up NIDA. Um, it, had a, it had a life, albeit in, in what you would call amateur theatre. But um, looking back on it with modern day sensibilities, it's um, very, very difficult to justify trying to perform it. And, and that's because our understanding of um, uh, some of the, especially some of the racist elements, if I may, in Baxter's play, um, the heightened sensibilities now about that would see that understood in quite a different way. They're just some examples I can think of. Adam, is that, are you indicating again? Yep, jump in. Yeah, I just have a quick question for JD. Um, is, is your website for the, for our Black Nisburn country still, still up? And, um, and is, is the uh, hard copy of the catalog still available? And if so, how do we get hold of it? Yeah, that's a yes to, to both questions. Um, in fact, actually, the National Library of Australia came forward and um, requested the website to be archived. Um, so there'll be a, a record even beyond its um, anticipated lifetime. But we kind of thought, you know, um, because they, there's still some interest that pops up here and there. You know, it might be three events like this one or, you know, there's, you know, um, students doing research, you know, writing master thesis or so. Um, so it kind of seemed, you know, good to kind of have, have this still ticking over. And yes, catalogs are available, available too. So you can um, approach me directly. I'll put my email in the, in the chat and, um, um, and um, then we can send you a copy. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Listen, I just need to let you all know, if you don't, don't know this already, and I, and I haven't personally had time to look at this myself, but Roy McLeod, has donated his nuclear archives to the University of Wollongong Library. And there's a lot of there's a lot of material there, um, and I'm not sure exactly what's in it, but there might be stuff there that you all might find useful for your research. Yes, yeah. please. I know Roy, and um, and he's you know would have some amazing material. So how can I access that? Well, just get in contact with the librarians at UOW Library. Right. Um, the, the guy who was curating it or archiving it, his name was White, I think his surname, but I don't remember his first name. I can, I can find out for you, Liz. Would you? That, that yeah, would just, really send, send me a reminder email because um, yeah. I'm leaving the country in a few days and things are a bit uh, flat out. Yeah, I certainly second that. We've, we've used the McLeod archive. Um, uh, Genevieve Rankin obtained it for a short time and took it with her to University of Western Sydney. And, um, that's, where, that's where I accessed it. Yeah, it's fantastic. And uh, it seemed to have documents that no one else had, you know, letters in particular. Yeah, I think that was one of the reasons he donated it because he did have material that didn't exist anywhere else. I mean, and going back to one of the discussions that we had earlier, I think it, I can't remember if it was Wayne or Mick brought this up about uh, ANSTO and the um, development of, of nuclear, uh, an Australian nuclear bomb. 
I mean, one of the things that I remember Roy telling me was that there, there were photographs of the centrifuges that they had at Lucas Heights on one of the monthly Anstone newsletters, but it was withdrawn. And there's, he had the only copy of that newsletter with the photo of the centrifuge. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that is in the archives too. Yeah. Well, are I think any of those archives digitised or are they, would I have to go there? I think you physically have to go there. He has, um, the archivist has, has, I'm pretty sure he's catalogued everything that's there, but that, I haven't spoken to him about it for at least three years. So I'm not sure what's been going on in the interim. Thank you. Can I just throw in, because I think it's relevant to both panels, about the importance of public archiving of nuclear materials? simply because official government documents come in and out of availability. Um, for example, the United States Department of Energy released a whole lot of documents in the 1990s under the Clinton administration, and then subsequent administrations um, reclassified them. Um, so the challenge for everything from you know, primary material to artworks and so on, um, once we all move on, um, future generations find that really important. And I had a magic moment for the book. There were two English women on Christmas Island um, amongst 3,400 blokes during the, the grapple nuclear tests. Very hard to find information for them. And I contacted what was the Women's Voluntary Service in Oxford. And they said, oh, there's an intern found a box up in the attic. Would you like to go through it? And I sent, you know, paid 40 pounds for an intern to go looking and all their letters from Christmas Island back to London, to Oxford were there, their quarterly reports, and they were sitting in a rat-eaten box in the attic. Um, so I think that history of, of the untold history, not the story of the William Pennies, but what happened to Aboriginal communities or Fijians or whatever, is a central challenge of this, because there's a lot of invisibility in the nuclear story. Mm. And I think, you know, the. JD, you know, when we're drawing our budgets, how do we ensure that the, you know, there's money to archive it later? <laughs> so it doesn't all have to be recreated every time, but the, but the future PhD students can go back and use that material. I just think both in terms of historians, sociologists and artists, this is a, a part of the budgeting process. Sorry to butt in, but it's a hobby horse. Uh, I think it's, it's an important one. I think it's crucial. Can I just add to that, Alexander? Oh, yep. um, one thing to watch is the development of the new um, Indigenous wing associated with the South Australian Museum. Um, the, the physical space has been um, granted and I think funded. Um, JD may know more about this, but um, over the next um, five to ten years, one of the objectives there is, is to comprehensively archive um, documentation about nuclear arts. Um, and a guy that I mentioned in my acknowledgements, Nico Taylor, who's doing some work to also try and make that happen, or Jared Thomas, who's the Indigenous uh, curator at the, at the museum, at least I think he still is. Um, so that's, that's one, I think, really important development for those of us involved in um, atomic arts. And the, the other thing I'd raise, I, in fact, it's a question to everyone here. Um, a piece of work that I'm uh, likely to do because, as I said, we're trying to revitalise half a life, is revisit the materials from Major Alan Batchelor. Um, has anyone else here heard of Alan Batchelor? He was the commander of many of the veterans who served at Maralinga. And then as they became ill and he became ill, he made it his, his life's work to um, assemble the documentation they would need to fight court cases um, to win compensation. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing some of Alan's stuff, but it's, it's over a decade ago since I looked at it. And, um, it, it was incredibly extensive, um, really important material. Anyway, just mention those. 
Thanks, Paul. Derek, I wonder if you've got anything to offer, and given that you've done so much work on the Canadian uh, nuclear industry, have you got anything that you can contribute? He's there. Maybe he's gone. He's on mute. Yeah. Are you there, Darren? No, I don't think he is. Hard to tell if you're on mute and your camera's turned off, eh? I had another quick one. I don't know if people have seen the papers this morning, but the Australian War Memorial extension has just been approved. Um, they're going to spend $450 million on expanding the War Memorial. And a number of people have been campaigning that there should be a proper section on Maralinga, Montebello and uh, related matters. Um, so just flag that for all of us, <laughs> both yeah. as historians and journalists and, and art workers, that to have more than one tiny little panel um, on Maralinga uh, in this huge, the expanded war memorial in coming years, I think will be a political fight, um, as has been seen with what happened at the Smithsonian over the history of uh, the Enola Gay and things, that there will be military people who don't want to have that in the war memorial. But I think it's an important part of Australian history that we should be you know, beginning to marshal the troops to start early, <laughs> that uh, the Australian War Memorial should have a full proper display and archival resources um, to record this important part of Australian history. I can, I can add a little anecdote to this. Um, so when I, when I toured the exhibition, I also kind of got in contact with the Australian War Memorial, knowing for sure, of course, that I had no space to show it. But, you know, I was, of course, interested to see what they had in their collections and the Reginald Road watercolours, um, you know, were on loan, uh, were lent by the War Memorial. So um, that happens so that um, some of the, the staff of kind of knew what I was doing and probably kind of watching from the sidelines how all this would unfold. And it was, um, I think in the latter part of the exhibition or the exhibition might have already been closed. Um, when I kind of got a notification at the Australian War Memorial had bought a work by Jonathan Kamanjara Brown on the Marilinga tests um, at auction. So it is actually now in their collection. So when I had a subsequent visit, I kind of met the curator and congratulated them on the purchase and asked whether it would go on display somewhere. They said they have to kind of keep this under wraps at the moment because um, their senior staff or you know, the, the director of the war memorial doesn't want to like to make a fuss about this. So. Um, so I got the feeling that here was, um, you know, um, the, the middle management kind of, you know, do, doing quietly their own thing in the background, you know, wait, waiting perhaps for, for the times to change a bit. Um, but maybe that's sort of my interpretation of things. And so your interpretation is correct, JD, having had dealings with them in a big Vietnam War exhibition about 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Is um, Brendan Nelson still the the director or the CEO, the former former minister, former Liberal Party minister. Yes, yeah, he is. and this this expansion is his baby. Yeah. And there's been a big campaign because they're getting sponsorship for a number of the um, exhibition halls. From there was proposals that BAE and other weapons manufacturers would sponsor parts of it. That seems to be knocked on the head, but this is uh, an ongoing. This is the history wars <laughs> being played out. And as I say, in Japan, in, in, in other places, in France, the, the sensitivities of the nuclear era still linger, um, yeah. simply because there are ongoing campaigns around recognition, compensation, reparations. Um, and uh, even in nuclear free New Zealand, it took 15 years for the New Zealand government to agree to uh, a medal for the, uh, the grapple uh, sailors and the sailors who'd gone in 1973 on a ship to protest the Mororoa tests. Um, and that, um, uh, that, that, you know, the ongoing claims around reparations, compact, compensation, recognition are still part of this, this whole process, despite the end of testing you know, in 1996.
It's disgraceful, frankly, I think. Well, I think we've run out of time, haven't we, Alexander? We're running we out of time. Yeah. So, so I'll stop recording.